Okay, so what we have uh, to look at here is basically what we've covered so far this year. So it has been a 24 week course, um, and that's in one slide effectively everything that we've covered. Uh, we started out by doing very simple programs, just printing out the screen. Then we made it slightly more complicated by adding in the idea of um, calculations, of expressions, of arithmetic inside our uh, inside our output. So we could have a system of an outprint that would do some sort of math inside it and give us the solution to that. We then made it more useful by introducing the idea of variables. So not only could we do calculations, but we could store either the component elements, the operate, the operands in those in those calculations, or the results of those calculations, to then be printed out or to be acted upon later on. So now we had printing out to the screen and a way of storing information. We made it more useful again by adding in user input. So now we get the user to enter in values, and based on the values the user entered in, we could perform the same calculation with the user defined values. And so we're slowly edging our way forward to more useful programs. We then introduced the idea of conditions, of asking questions of our code. If we had user input and we had variables, we could also define that when a specific input or when a specific range of inputs were entered in, our code would do something different to when they weren't added in. And that was the idea of an if statement with our if, else, if, uh, uh, and else conditions inside there. When we had done that, <clears throat> when we changed the flow of our code, so it didn't just run from line zero or line one down to line n that we could have sections where we skipped or sections where we went into depending on what the values were in the program we had a look at the idea of loops and loops allowed us to um basically do a certain segment of code more than once uh this wasn't too useful on its own we kind of did stuff like count up to a thousand count up to a thousand and increments of three pretty rudimentary stuff but the idea of a loop of being able to do effectively the same task multiple times was quite interesting and when we combine that with our next topic with strings, it became really useful. So strings was our first data type, was our first variable that dealt with more than one value. All of the variables we've dealt with beforehand, our integers, our doubles, our booleans, our characters, they were individual values. You can hold one number, you can hold one billion value, you can hold one character. When we had a string, we had a collection, we had a bunch of them together. And when we had a bunch of them together, we could process that string we're using a loop where we could design this systematic way of starting at the beginning of the loop and working our way through to the end of the loop, taking every character and applying some sort of computation to it, whether it's checking to see if it's a vowel or checking to see if the full stop of counting the sentences or checking to see if the space of counting the words. We do a systematic way of going through it. And we spent a couple of weeks here. We, we, we did a lot of work there. You did a lot of work in the relation to your first assignment there. And that development of a systematic approach to our problem solving, a systematic approach to here's some data, I want you to make sure that X is true or Y is true or verify that Z is not present, that it would work its way through it. And you'd make sure that in that solution, you checked every option, you didn't skip, you did it in a, uh, an ordered fashion, you'd start at one end and you'd slowly progress your way to the other end. And that was a really good um, practice habit to build up because it allowed us to have a really good approach to whenever we're dead, we're handed a collection of data and we're told, okay, do something with it. Our immediate choice, our immediate first thought should be, okay, how can I do this systematically? Can I design a use case for one element in that? Now, if I can do it for one element, well, then I can go and I can check a bunch of elements because all I'm doing is I'm shifting the window of focus from the first element in that collection to the second element, to the third element, to the fourth element, and work my way through it. And then the last thing we looked at in the first semester was the idea of methods. And methods didn't add any functionality to our code, but it allowed us to compartmentalize our code. We could take a function, a, a section of code that does one action, and bundle it up. And it became almost a black box, or it could become a black box. Or I could say, all right, you send in this required input into the program or to this function, it does something magical and it pumps out an answer in this format. Or it does a particular action and you don't need to worry about how it does it. You don't need to worry about, well, does the code work? Because you've designed that function in isolation, you know that works. So when you would incorporate it into larger projects, you'd see that it would continue to work. 
And we, we, we would have worked a lot on this with our zombie dice assignment and kind of building our way through that. And that was essentially semester one. So the left hand side there is essentially semester one and everything we looked at in semester one. Semester one is our core fundamental elements of computer science. Okay? If you take everything we've done in semester one, and that's all you did, you could apply that to almost any other programming language. Okay, how do you compare a variable? How do you do an if statement? How do you do a loop? Uh, how do I take a, a collection, a string in this example? How do I write a method? And you could probably get up and running in that language pretty quickly. Uh, if you were to take something really similar, like C sharp, you'd be up and running, I'd say, in about a week, if even a week. Uh, if you were really committed, one afternoon would probably get, up, get you up and running in C-sharp, except for the nuances about like how do I compile and how do I print it, because it's different, it's not system that out in, in, in um, C-sharp, it's console out. There's little small things like that. The left hand side, or sorry, the right hand side is essentially going to be our second semester. And we started our second semester with looking at one-dimensional arrays. And the one-dimensional arrays were a slight extension on strings. So the idea of a string is I have a collection of characters. I can group those characters together as a string, and I can handle, I can process through them and systematically. An array is effectively the same concept of, of, of a collection, but we're not restricted to a collection of characters. We can have a collection of integers. We can have a collection of doubles. We can have a collection of strings where each element in that array is a string. And inside that string, you may have multiple characters. So we could build up kind of quite comprehensively. We then looked at two-dimensional arrays and how would you process through an array that's not only a line going across, but it's kind of a, it's a grid format. You have rows and you have columns. And in both the one-dimensional arrays and the two-dimensional arrays, we brought back our experience and our knowledge of systematic processing. How do I take how I dealt with a collection of characters of strings, and how do I apply that to my um, to my array? And it's basically the exact same premise. Start at one end, traditionally you can start at index zero, the first element. Do whatever processing you're going to do, move on to the next element, and repeat that until we get to the end of that collection. And that systematic check meant that we could process through, we could work through a large amount of data but not really worry about it. For all of our code, all the code that you guys developed that related to strings, or related to arrays, or related to two-dimensional arrays, where you checked if it was an even number, you checked if it was a number divisible by 50, you um, checked to see if it was an uppercase letter, you shifted the letter up in the alphabet by a certain amount. And if it went off the edge, if it went off the edge to kind of like above Z, you'd loop it back around to the bottom. You probably tested those files or those programs on small collections, 10, 5 elements, not, not really big ones. But they all scale up. Your systematic approach to, go, to, to saying, in any one element, I'm going to do this, and this will have a positive or a negative outcome, that's fine. And then I'm going to move on to the next element, and I'm going to keep doing that until I hit the end. And they all scale up exponentially. I could take a string that has five Characters in it and apply that Caesar cipher question to it and make sure my code works with five, and then I can scale up to the entire works of Shakespeare. So millions and millions of characters. I just push that out. And it would still work. It would take longer to run, but that systematic approach of you have a huge bunch of characters. Start the first one, do this, move on to the next one, do this, move on to the next one, and keep doing that until you hit the end. That's the, the, the pattern that we've developed. After we finished an arrays, we took a little break to have a look at objects and classes, and we saw that objects and classes are essentially a way of making custom variables. When we have got an array, we can have a collection, but all those collections are locked by a data type. You can have an array of integers, but you can only have integers inside that. You can have an array of uh, doubles, but you can only have doubles. Your zombie dice assignment, I'm sure, highlighted some of those frustrations, where you might have had a a uh, username array, which was strings, and a user score array, which was integers. And why couldn't you just have an array of users, which would have a name and a score? And that's what objects and classes allowed us to have a look at. 
And this was just a peak at that. We're going to go back in second semester or in the first semester or second year, and we're going to spend a full 12 weeks looking at that in more detail. But it gave us an introduction and allowed us to have these custom um, data types where you can have a bunch of information but collect it as one group so you can into the string and something else. And we could also see that we used that in our last assignment. We then looked at the idea of file access, reaching outside of our program to access either a text file or access a binary file. And before we did that, we saw what exceptions were. And we saw what runtime errors were. Now, we've been seeing runtime errors throughout the year, but now we looked at, well, how do we handle it? How do we actually cope with a runtime error? And the reason why we needed our exceptions before we could deal with our either text files or our binary files was because we're no longer 100% in control of all of the content. When it was just our code, we could say, yeah, no, we wrote that. I know every element in there. It's not going to be a problem. But as soon as you reach outside your program to an external source, so a text file or a binary file, this is a scenario here, you cannot verify it. And that's why you needed the exception there, in case something went wrong, not because of your code, just because we're living it, we're, your code's going to live and run on a computer which is lots of other stuff happening at the same time. So we looked at text files, which are plain text files. When we say plain text files, we mean something that you can open up in Notepad and you can read. There are English words there, they're all discernible. And then we looked at our binary files, which is a more efficient, a more optimized way of storing information because we're storing it as a binary string, which means we can hold more information in a smaller space. But the downside is they're not as reasonable, as readable. You need to have, um, you need to have a way of interpreting the string or the stream of, uh, of ones and zeros, squash that back into, there's an integer, there's a string, there's a whatever it might be. And the last thing we looked at, which we spent the last couple of weeks looking at, was the idea of sorting. And we did three algorithms of sorting. We did selection sort, we did bubble sort, and we did insertion sort. Um, they all got slightly more complicated as we went through, but none of them were massively complicated. They are all very inefficient. They do the job, they just don't do the job well. They, from a processing point of view, they are costly, they take a lot of time. Next year, in the second semester, we're going to look at additional, um, faster, more efficient algorithms. But the reason why we introduced sorting here is the same reason why we introduced objects in classes, just to give you a taste of where programming can go, what we can do. And the nice thing about these algorithms, while it might have been frustrating to learn a specific pattern that you have to do, you have to do step one, have to do step two, and there's no wiggle room in that, it shows that these algorithms, the classic structures of programming that have been around since the 40s, are based on the basic stuff we looked at in first year, or first semester, okay? You go back and have a look at the stuff we did in the last section, sorting, selection sort, insertion sort, bubble sort. They use loops, they use variables, they use if statements. That's it. They didn't use methods, they didn't have to use methods, they didn't use strings, they didn't use arrays, they didn't use exceptions or text files or objects or classes. If you've done programming before, they don't use linked lists, they don't use queues, stacks, they don't use any of those other data structures that make programming more robust, more full. The algorithms we looked at were using the really, really basic stuff, the stuff that we had essentially finished by week seven, our first semester. And they just said, hey, you know, you can combine this, these basic elements to make a much more complicated, a much more um, interesting uh, algorithm to work. And that's, that's, what we, that's why we finished up with that for the year. It's to show you that the basic stuff we covered in first semester is so vital. It's going to be something that every single program you were going to write between now and the end of the degree, between now and probably the end of your programming career, will always relate to those elements on the left-hand side. And not even all, basically the first four that we had there. Once you can do the first four and you know them backwards, you can make a really good attempt at almost any program. It might, it, 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 I can guarantee it will not be the most efficient attempt, but it'll be a good attempt. It'll be, it works as opposed to it works and it does it efficiently or does it well. But that's first year. Um, I said this with the full-time class, and I say it with E as well. 
if this is a module, and I don't like saying this ahead of the exam, but if this is a, if this is a module where you are less than 100% confident in going into the examination, if it's something where you're kind of going, there's, there's big sections of that that I'm, that I'm a bit shaky at. Well, first of all, I'll say, why didn't you email me before today? Because it could have structured some of the revision to that. But we'll ignore that point. Focus on the left-hand side of this page. Focus on the content there. Okay? And the reason why is you'll see when we go through the exam. If you know the left-hand side, you know the left-hand side well, you will be able to do little bits of almost every question. You'll be able to do almost all of question one completely. You'll be able to do good chunks of some of the later questions. But if you don't know the left-hand side well, you kind of half know the left-hand side and you know little bits of this, you really are just picking off small marks here and there. So if this is a module which you're finding tough, from a short-term solution, focus on the left-hand side. If this is a module you're finding tough from a long-term solution, this is a four-year degree in computer science. There is programming at the heart of this module, or at the heart of this, this degree. Um, whatever you are finding as a challenge for this, whether it's the, the, the problem-solving aspects, the remembering the code, not giving enough time for practice, whatever it might be, you need to start coming up with a plan to, to, to resolve that, because First year is first year, fine, but as we go through second year, it's obviously going to increase in difficulty and in complexity, and that will happen for third year and for fourth year as well. Um, there are some things you will cover in this degree, which you'll cover in the degree and you'll never really go beyond that. If you did the Irish Leading Cert or the Junior Cert, you did Geography, I don't think I've ever. What did I do with Junior Cert? Right, so we're over 20 years since I've done the Junior Cert. I've never have to talk about a U-shaped valley or a V-shaped valley or glacial erosion or any of the other stuff that we cover in geography. But if you're starting a degree in computer science, my assumption is that you're going to want to stay within the IT sector. There are some modules which you, depending on your career, you may never actually really spend a lot of time looking at. But programming is not one of them. Everyone I know, no matter whether they are IT support, whether they're a database administrator, whether they are a web developer, a an app developer, a games developer, a network engineer, um, a hardware developer, a hardware constructor with like build PCs. At some point, they write some element of code. It can be a script they do once or twice a year. It can be a program they're writing every day of the week. But there is programming in their life. There is programming in their career. So programming is something you really need to kind of get your head around. So from a long-term solution, just focusing on this side is not going to be sustainable. But in the roughly six weeks no not six weeks two weeks you have until the examination and um, that's a short-term solution if, if, if you are worried about that but let's have a look at the exam because maybe maybe you haven't looked at the exam and maybe when you actually go through the exam you feel far happier about what's going to be asked okay so the examination if you look at the past exams, and the past exams are available on Moodle uh, from 2015 up to 2018, so we have four years worth of papers, two exams per year, there's an exam in May, there's an exam in August. So that's eight examinations that you have as practice, as resources to have a look at. The style of questions is going to be the same. The big difference is this year, uh, you, you guys are taking the first iteration of the new program, in the last version of the program, we did not have systems analysis in first year. So I did an element of design and of design flow um, with programming. So it made sense as you started to get bigger programs, you kind of need to know where, where information was going and why it was going there and where it was stored. So you will see in the questions two, three, four, and five in past exam papers, there's marks going for design. There is no marks going for design in 2019. Okay? I will explain more as we go through. But the way the question or the way the exam works is question one is compulsory and for 40 marks of the 100 marks for the paper. You have to do it. If you don't do it, you've jeopardized or you've, you've given away those 40 marks. Uh, it covers the entire course. It is six or seven short questions that go from talking about variables 
all the way up to the possibility of talking about uh, sorting. Uh, I don't have, if I ask you to write code, it's little snippets of code, it's not a lot of code. Mostly it's stuff like explain the difference between uh, runtime errors and compile time errors. Uh, explain what a, uh, how a loop works. Explain what the guard on a loop does, or how it, like, the guard on a loop tells the program to finish running that loop. Okay, so it's, it's your explanation of how the code works. Questions two, three, four, five, and six are worth 15 marks each, and you do four of them. They are of the scale of your class test questions. Okay, your class test questions are good indications of where to work. And they generally are on a specific topic. So there will be 99% assurance there's going to be a question on text files. There's going to be a question on objects. There's going to be a question on sorting. There's going to be a question on arrays. And there's probably going to be another question on something else, something involving a method or string manipulation or something. All the big topics that we looked at, the stuff that we spent a little bit of time at, the fundamental stuff, loops, if statements, variables. There's no one question on them because they're in every single question. And most importantly, from a timing point of view, your examination is three hours in Lent. Okay? Uh, I believe the exam you took in January was only two hours. Is that correct? Or was it three? Two? Okay. So two hours because it's a one semester module. Because it's a full year long module, those ones are going to be three hours. So here's a little bit of exam math for you. This is a uh, structure I have worked with my students from the last eight years or so of doing computer programming with them. Uh, it works out well. The exam is 180 minutes in length. You have 100 marks to earn in that examination. I would recommend that you read the paper from front to back at the start. Spend 15 minutes reading it. Read every question. Even if you're going into that examination going, I'm not doing the question on sorting. Read the question on sorting. Read every word that's on that script. Two reasons for this. The first reason is um, lectures are only required to be in that exam hall for the first 30 minutes of the, um, of the exam. Traditionally, I have a big enough group, and there are requirements within that group that I may not all be, I, you, all of my students for computer programming may not all be in the same room. So I might need to hop to another room and come back again. But, and because of that, I usually hang around for a minimum 40 minutes. But, the best thing to do, if you're unsure of anything in the examination, is to ask. And the best person to ask is me, because I wrote the paper. And I know what I'm expecting as a result. So you can ask any one of the invigilators, but they may not be able to answer. You can ask the invigilator when I'm not there, and then they can contact me, and then there's a time period where you're waiting for me to get back to go and answer the question. So that all eats into the time you have in the examination. Best to get the questions done out of the way at the beginning. Okay. Second reason why is more of a kind of a cognitive learning um, theory, or not theory, but cognitive learning uh, rule. Um, your brain doesn't like problems. It doesn't like problems left uncompleted. Uh, and whether you want to or not, it tries to work on them in the background. Okay. Um, once you start removing distractions out of your uh, immediate attention, you can see that your brain will start solving problems for you. We don't have that luxury in an exam because you have three hours of hopefully you can distract it for the whole three hours because you're focusing on whatever question you're doing. But reading the questions and then also read questions one, two, three, four, five, six, then go back to question one, start working on that. Your brain is starting to chip away at all of the other questions you're not actively working you're currently working on. And that gives you more thinking time in a three-hour period to work on those questions. Okay. Um, I also recommend at the end, this is there's no science behind this. This is my own issues with exams. So I kind of try to relay that back to you guys as students. You spend 15 minutes at the end writing reading what you wrote. Um, I don't like exam environments. Never did like them. And I found, especially in not so much programming, when I was doing the leaving cert, in, in stuff like English and Irish, 
that my brain and my hand weren't always in sync. So I might be thinking one thing, I'm trying to write down as fast as I can, and I've gone back and I've read stuff that I've written down thinking it was fine, and it is terrible. Completely wrong. Things just not making sense. And what I've learned is that spending, dedicating some time at the end of the examination just to read back over it might be enough to kind of catch, oh, I missed this thing. You can quickly scribble down something that actually completes out the answer and makes, it, makes sense of it. Uh, reading back over what you've written down as a solution and reading the question and going, oh, I missed the other thing you were asking for. Again, might give you the time to add in just a quick note on something. It won't fix an entire paper. If you spent the entire exam struggling with it, the 15 minutes at the end is not going to fix it. But it's there as kind of a, an insurance package, just to make sure before I hand it over. It's like doing your spell check before you submit your essay assignment. Probably fine, but you're just going to do one last spell check just to make sure before you hand it up. And conveniently, that leaves you 150 minutes for after active work. So my basic measurement is for every one mark you have on the exam paper, you should spend approximately a minute and a half on it. Okay? Ten mark question, you spend 15 minutes on it. This is not a absolute rule. This is a working guideline for you in an exam environment. So what I've seen over the last eight years of teaching first year programming, but all 15 years of lecturing, is there has always been a student who really manages their time poorly in an examination. Um, they think they're doing fine, they're writing away, they're putting lots of concentration in, and hours has gone by and they realize they've answered one 20 mark question. And then they have two hours to answer the remaining 80 marks worth of that paper, okay? That type of time management can put a huge amount of unneeded stress on you in an exam environment. So having a really rough rule of thumb, every exam hall is going to have a clock or multiple clocks in there. You can have your own watcher or, 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 or clock on your desk. So if you can start and go, right, it is now half six. Ten mark question, I should be done by quarter to seven. And at quarter to seven, if you look at it and go, I need another 30 seconds, give it the 30 seconds. Because it gives you a timeline of, oh, yeah, I'm pretty much on track. But you don't want to spend half an hour on it. You don't want to spend 40 minutes on it, okay? Because it allows you to keep more stuff. And it's not perfect because if we go back and have a look at the topics, some of those topics you will fly through. Some of those topics you will struggle with. Because that's naturally the way it happens. So text files might be something which there are 22 minutes for that question. This is a 15-mark question. You might get it done in 10 minutes. You might double check it, spend another three, four minutes double checking it, yeah, it's fine. You now have an extra nine minutes to go toward another question which you found more challenging, which might take half an hour rather than 30 minutes, or sorry, rather than 22 minutes. So that's what I'm looking for, is that you, you set yourself up for the best exam environment you can get. Part of it's preparation. We're gonna go through the exam paper again to kind of assist with that. Part of it is being strategic about where you are as a student and what you can best dedicate your time and your study towards. And part of it is having a, a good plan of action to do in the exam, regardless of whatever questions go. Because if you have all of that, then it's a matter of just going in and doing the work. And you have the plan and you have the, the work that you're going to go through. Another reason why I put those timing elements up there is it gives you a really good indication for your practice. The number one way I would advise you to study for this examination, get an exam paper and do the exam papers. Ideally, in exam conditions. That means no notes, under a time constraint, with starting with a blank sheet of paper, nothing else. If you, can, if you can work your way up to that, you are in a really good position for doing the exams. If your timing is off, well, it's not a huge amount. Practice gets your timing better. If you have to have notes, again, practice makes you better at that because you get more comfortable. Oh, I know it's been asked here. Um, but that's kind of what you need to work on. So let's have a look at last year's August paper. So these papers, first of all, do people know where to find the exam papers on Moodle? Yep. So when you log in, let me quickly show just in case there's any issue with that. So when you log into Moodle, if 
you go to use the links, you'll see that there's a tag here called exam information from the neat library. Uh, and we click on that, then you'll see computing is down here for past papers. And you click on computing. It gives you the list. Now it goes from chronological order, starting with the oldest. It starts in 2015, and then inside each year goes alphabetical. So if we go August, then January, then May. Um, we are in stage one. Our subject specifically is CP. Now it'll have CCS, HCC, BSEO, BSEH. That's just because this is common across a couple of courses because it's a fundamental module. Um, especially, not, not so much for part-timers, but in a full-time group, I might have four or five different programs in the same class. Um, so you can see here, but it's CP is the one you're looking for, and it's always going to be in stage one of the BSC. Um, so that will be August there. And so you can scroll down through these. These shrink back up again as well if you don't want to have a look at, let's say, August. Uh, so if it's January, not there. May, you'll have... CP then as well. Okay, so that's where you find your exam papers. This is the August paper from last year. Uh, okay, right. So, again, this has changed slightly for this year. There are not five questions, there are six questions. Question, or is it, there are six questions, five of them are in total are to be attempted. Section A, that means question one is compulsory, and then you're to do four of the other questions in section B. Now, question one, part A, for the last eight years has always been the same type of question. It's going to be the same type this year. This is not a secret. I tell it to every year, every student, um, and every year I get students giving me the wrong answers. Okay? What well, section A is going to be, Sorry, what part A of question one is going to be, is it's going to be five Boolean expressions. I'm going to give you an English description of what I want, and I want you to write out the Java code to evaluate this. So the key thing here is, what is a Boolean expression? A Boolean expression is the thing that goes inside the brackets after the word if, or goes inside the brackets after the word while. It's the guard to see, are you allowed into the if statement? Are you allowed into the while loop? For example, what I've got here, A is a negative number. Oop. Da, da, da. So the first one there, A, the variable A, is a negative number. And you can see here from the preliminary stuff, all these variables are integers. Okay. A is a negative number. Sorry, negative odd number. What I'm looking for there is a piece of code that no matter what the value of A is, can evaluate if A is actually a negative odd number. What I do not want is minus 17. I don't want an actual number. If you're writing down an actual number for any of these, you're doing it wrong. I want you to write out as if it were an if statement. So if I get this piece of code here. So here, if I were to do that and say, actually, this is going to be uh, that, I would say A is, well, how do I say it's a negative number? First of all, negative means it's less than zero. That's the first part. And A modulus 2 is equal to 1. That is a negative odd number. Negative, it's less than zero. That's the easy part. Everyone should get that. The odd number is, well, if you divide by 2, is there something left over? So you can have a d of 2 is equal to 1, or you can have that's fine too. That would work too. So a d of 2 is not equal to 0. If it's equal to 0, if a d of 2 is 0, in other words, if you divide whatever the value of a is, if you divide that by 2 and the remainder is 0, that means it's an even number. So I got both of those expressions are basically the same thing. But the key point here is, have I answered it? Have I checked to see if A is a negative number? Yes, I have. Have I checked to see if A is an, an odd number? Yes, I have. Okay, you're finished. Nowhere in that 
code have I put the value of A? We don't know it. Let's assume user input. We have no idea what the value of A is going to be entered in. This is a really simple program. Enter in a number. Yes, that's a negative odd number. That's all it's going to do. So, so, you, so you don't need a loop actually fully written, like the word word or if or anything like that. No, 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 absolutely not. If you want, and I've seen students do this well, if you want, if this makes you more comfortable to go if. If you want to do that so that it clicks with you, oh, yeah, it's an if statement. And if, it's, and if this statement's true and it prints true on the screen, that's no problem at all. You will not gain any marks for doing that. You will not lose any marks for doing that. Your penalty for writing this extra stuff is the time it takes you to write it. I don't need that. The only thing I'm grading is this here. Okay? But if you want to write this statement, you want to write a quick while loop to do that, absolutely. I don't need it, but you can. It's only worth two marks. So again, you're looking at a maximum. If it's worth two marks, one and a half times, three minutes maximum doing this. Okay? Let's go through each of these. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, 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 every year I really hammer on about part A. Every year, it's like it's the time. The reason why it's there. is because the expression that was on some of your faces when I was talking about if programming is not your favorite module ever, and you find it a little bit tough, is not an uncommon expression that I see. And having 10% of the paper where you kind of know what's going to come up, and you can pr there is, like if I've got five here and I've got eight papers, that's 40 examples that I can go through. I can make sure that I'm really confident and going through this. I put it here specifically to give you a good start in the exam paper. It's 10%. If you know it, you know it. If you don't know it, you don't know it. You can practice for it, but it's not like you can learn this stuff off. You can't learn every Boolean condition because that's a ridiculous amount of content. But it's definitely something you can prep knowing it's coming up. And it gives you a good start in the paper. It means that, again, if, if programming isn't a strong thing for you, you're only looking for a remaining 30 marks out of the remaining 90 possible marks. So it puts you in a good position in that perspective. So let's go through the rest of these. So B is a number that's divisible by 174 and by 23. I do not want a number. When I have something like that, I pick weird numbers like that. I always get someone asking for a calculator. You do not need a calculator for this. The program will work out if it is or is not divisible by both of them. What I'm looking for here is, uh, so B, modulus, the first number, zero. And if I ask if something's divisible, I mean, is it divisible by zero? Or sorry, is it divisible evenly? So you need to have the modulus command for that. So it's divisible by 174 and is B divisible by 23? That's it. That's all I'm looking for. Okay. My wish today is that you're looking at this going, that's really simple. If you're looking at that now and that is really simple, that's what I want because I want you to be, look, see if this is really attainable marks. Whatever you think about the remaining 90 marks on the paper, this should not be something. This question one part A should not be something you're worried about. Let's have a look at part C or part three. Okay, C is either less than 111 and bigger than 53, or C is a negative number. It should be capital C. Uh, there should be an extra bracket there. Okay, so this one's a tricky one. This one's a, a tricky one from the point of view that it's not just the first one, we had one conjunction there. The second one, we had one conjunction. Here we have a mistyped conjunction and a disjunction as well. Okay, so you have an and and an or been used at the same time or in the same statement. 
But look at the look at the sentence. C is either less than this, and, and I use the word and. If I use the word and in this question, you need an and gate. C is bigger than this, or same thing. If I use the word or, I'm expecting an or gate. C is a negative number. Any one of them, C is negative, C is bigger than 53, C is less than 111, they're all simple to do. So your challenge here is how do I combine them up? How do I match them up? Okay. <clears throat> okay. D, E, and F are in sequential, are in ascending sequential order. So essentially what I'm asking there is, is it is D the values of D, E, and F? Is it something like one, two, three, two, three, four? Three, four, five. So, like there are three numbers together on the number line. So, what I'd look for here is that let's say uh, they're in ascending order, which means we're going to check to see if D plus one is equal to E. Okay. So, if you have the numbers three and four, which are sequential and ascending, if you add one to the lower number, it should equal the larger number. Does that make sense? And E plus 1 is equal to F. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm looking for here. I've had other students do this, so D is going to be smaller than E, and E is going to be smaller than F. That's definitely ascending order, but it's not sequential in the sense that they're not all together in a number line. If you're unsure, this is one of these examples, right? Most people will be able to get this one down really quickly. That. Just make sure you understand the words in the question. If you don't understand what the word is, ask. Uh, you've been through an exam already, so you're aware that there are dictionaries available. Whether English is your first language or not, you can get a dictionary. So if you don't understand a word, ask or look it up. Um, because it will help you understand the question. If you understand the question, you know what you're meant to be attempting. In other words, you're not guessing an answer. Okay, the last one. G is not the cube of H. Okay? So Q is something multiplied by itself, multiplied by itself. Okay? <laughs> So, and H is the bigger number. So H would be the resultant of that. So what we're looking for here is that G multiplied by G multiplied by G is not equal to H. That's all I'm looking for there. Okay? So we're saying G there. It's not the cube of H. So G cubed is not equal to H. That's what I want to make sure. Okay? <clears throat> Hopefully, they all seem sensible. Hopefully, having seen how little is required to answer those, you will dedicate a bit of time to them in your preparation for the examination. Um, like I've done, there are 40 available over all the exam papers. I've done five. You only have to do another 35 yourself. Honestly, that's like a half an hour sitting down, go through them, and then cross-check them against something else. If you want to write a program to test all of these, write them out of paper first, and then go and test them all in the program, absolutely fine. But there's something that you should go in confident. No matter what the rest of the paper's like, no matter how bad or good the questions are going to be, you should not have any worries about question one part A because you, you've practiced it enough. Okay, that is the only one that I can tell you 100% is going to be coming up in the exam because all of the rest of them vary. That's the thing that I don't change. You won't get these questions. You won't get negative odd. You won't get divisible by those numbers there. But they're good examples. And the more examples you do, the more comfortable you get, the easier it is to kind of go, oh, I know what that is. All right. Let's look at question B here. Question B, explain the differences between compile time errors and runtime errors. Give an example of each type of error. Now,
on reflection, that's a bit of a, a question which I shouldn't have I, I shouldn't have asked that question. Not because this is a hard question, but because every now and again I get students who English is not their first language and they are not good at speaking English, and they essentially regurgitate or reword the question back to me. This is one of these ones where actually that's almost the right answer. What is a compile time error? That is an error that happens when you're compiling the code. What is a runtime error? That is an error that happens when you're running the code. So if you were, if English is not your first language and you're trying to, oh, I'm just going to reword this set sentence back, like I've done that in French exams, right? I've just, just re reworded the question back. You would get almost that done, okay? So of these five marks, two of the marks are going for, for, for what's the difference? So what is compile time? That's one mark. What is runtime? That's one mark. Compile time error. I've missed a semicolon. I've missed a bracket. Uh, I haven't initialized the variable. I haven't declared a variable. I've tried to put a string into an integer, okay? They are compile time errors. If you have a compile time error, you never get to see what your code looks like with it running, because it doesn't let you run the program. It stops you, gives you all those error messages in the console. A runtime error is the opposite. Code compiles absolutely fine. But when you go to run it, it does not work. Sorry, that's incorrect. Code compiles absolutely fine when you go to run it, it crashes in the middle of it. It can crash because of array index out of bounds exception. How many of you have got that error in the last year? Your code compiles absolutely fine, you run it, it gets past first step, second step, crash. And it's always like an array index out of bounds, so it's always one more than what your array is. If you add um, five elements array, it's always going to be like the number five or the number six to, kind of, to go beyond that. <clears throat> Uh, give an example of each type of error. Well, that's literally a compile time error can be missing semicolon, variable not uh, declared, variable not initialized, uh, wrong type, lossy conversion. Did you ever try to put a double value into an integer? It tells you possible lossy conversion. They are compile time errors. Any error you have ever seen that comes up uh, when you compile your program before it actually goes to run. Okay, that any one of them you can think of. The easiest one is missing a semicolon. Give me an example of a runtime error. Division by zero. File not found. Um, array index out of bounds error. Okay, they are all the runtime errors. So I, in this example here, in this question here, I'll be looking for the definition or the difference between the two of them, and I'd look for an example of each to get the full five marks. <coughs> okay. Box list is not great. Hang on a sec. No, that's not what I wanted. Okay. Section C. Have a look at the section of code. What is happening in this code? Detail all of the outputs, sorry, all the inputs, all the outputs, and the functionality of this code. So, what's that code doing? Okay. Oh, very, very bad, is it? Okay. Uh, what are the inputs of that code? Variable x. Okay. Where, where do we set the value of the variable x? Uh, it's not set in there. It's not set there, is it? Exactly. Exactly. So here is <clears throat> what you want to do. There are errors in this code. There are there are da, 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 two errors in this code. The first error is sting, not string. Um, I will be honest with you. I cannot remember if that's a typo that I kind of went with. And, yeah, there's one of the errors, or whether it's an intentional error. And the second one is absolutely said that we've never actually set a value for it. We don't take user input anywhere here, and we've never set a value here. If we were to compile this code. First one we get is unrecognized symbol for sting. The second one we would have is x is not initialized. So we try to print out a variable that we haven't set the value for. What it should do, absolutely, is print out the value of x. It has no input, and there are two errors. So to get full marks in this, I'd want to know what it, what it does or what it's meant to do, if there are errors in the code, and where what, what is the input. There's no input on this. We have no way of setting the number. 
even if we had x equal to 7, you could say, look, there's no input, but x is set to 7. And we can kind of work from there. It's, do you understand the code? Can you look at a piece of code and go, that's correct, <clears throat> I know what it should do? Or that's incorrect, but I know what you're meant to be doing. And that's what I'm looking for here. OK. Uh, part D is an example of where I get you to write a small section of code. Design a currency conversion program to read an integer in from the user and to convert if, convert it, not if, convert it from euros to dollars if the exchange rate is one euro is equal to that many dollars. That's a very small and simple program. What I'm looking for there is do you remember to declare the scanner? Do you use the right command to take an integer in from the scanner? If you take an integer in from the scanner, you have to output a double because that's obviously going to give you um, a fractional value. Okay, So that's what I'm looking for there. But it's a small bit of program. I don't think anyone in this room is going to have a problem writing that code. That's, that's a pretty simple one. Part E, again, another study of the section. Here we are. So what's happening in this code? And let me actually, just to make life a little bit easier. Let me do that. Um, what's happening in this code? Again, details and so on. We'll ignore the fact that this is part E in question one, and I've named the method part E. Uh, that has no effect on the functionality of the code, it's just core naming on my part. But if you have a look at this, what is happening in that piece of code? You're missing the word erases, eh? Um, After the where? After the I plus plus. So here? Should we equal erase there? Technically, no, I don't need one. So if I had curly braces, if I had a curly brace here and one closing after this line here, that would be okay. Um, with loops and with if statements, if you don't have curly braces, the first line after this, the, the, the loop declaration or the if statement, it takes it in. But if you have multiple lines, you have to have a curly brace. Uh -huh. But if you put that in, absolutely. Okay, so let's say the curly braces were in there around that loop. What's that piece of code doing? Setting them up all the indexes in the array seven. Correct, yeah. It's creating an array of size x, set all the values to seven. Uh, are there any faults or any problems with that code? There's no return. There's no return value. I say up here, we're gonna send back an integer array, and I never send it back. So it creates your array, it populates your array with sevens, or I forget to send it back. Okay, so Again, it's one of these pieces of code where there are errors in it. But I also want you to tell you what I want you to tell me what it should be doing as well. Okay? So if you get a block like that, if you get a piece of code like this where it says what's happening in this code, look for errors, tell me what the errors are, and give me uh, an idea of if those errors are fixed, what would this code do? If you want, you can rewrite that code with all the errors fixed and then tell me what it does. Okay? Um, again, it's looking to see, do you understand the code? Okay. Um, a big part of first year is trying to stop you hacking away at the code. Type something out, that doesn't work, I'll change this. No, that doesn't work, I'll change this. No, that still doesn't work. You should be able to take a step back and look at the code and go, oh, I can see what's missing, or I can see what's wrong there. And that's an example here. You know what it should do, or you can get a good idea of what it should do, but then you can also say, oh, this is broken because no return statement. Whenever you have a method, if you if you see a method, you're given a block of code and you have a method, you have to have a return type. If we don't have a return type, we're in trouble. So it either has to be a, a variable or it has to be void. If it's void, we need to make sure we do not have the word return anywhere in the method. If it's not void, we need to make sure we do have the word return somewhere in the method. Okay. Part F. Explain the number range. So explain what number range the following code can produce. So random or is even the new random. Or dot next int 304 plus 8. Okay. So what I'm looking for here is what is the lower and upper bound of this block of random. What's the lowest number that piece of code can generate? Nope. Eight. Eight, yes, eight. So if 
This is going to give away the other side. Um, <clears throat> whatever, when you go next into the random number, whatever value you put inside here, it goes from zero up to, but not including that number. So it'll go, if I didn't have the plus eight there, that would be zero to 303. And then what the plus eight, the other side does, it takes whatever values there are and shifts it up by that number. So rather than starting at zero, <coughs> it's going to, it'll start at eight. So what's the upper bound on that? What's the highest number that can generate? 211. 211, yeah. Because it, goes, it doesn't include the 304 because it starts counting at zero. Okay? Um, so, yeah. So, basically, what I'm looking for there is 8 to 311. Um, if you want to explain it more, you can, but that's all I'm actually looking for. It's just the lower band and the upper band. Okay, last question for part one. If the upper positive range of an integer variable is that number there, what happens to the code segment below and why? So what the code segment below is takes that number and it goes plus plus and then tries to print out what the result is. So what's going to happen to that? What's the output for that program? Is the number too big to uh, have to do with large instead of n? Uh, no, because and the reason the, the, the reason why I asked the question is because that's not a problem. Java and programming languages have a way of factoring in for that. But if we go above the upper range, it has a way of handling that rather than crashing the program. It goes to the minus. Does it? it goes to the lowest possible number. So if you went plus plus here it would drop to the negative range, essentially minus that number there, and continue counting up. So let's say you had a counter, and you started counting up and up and up and up and up and up and up. Eventually, that counter kept going, it would exceed that value there, and then what happens is, well, we won't crash the program, we'll reset to the lowest possible value and keep counting up. And so if it goes all the way, it's, it, it, the same would be if I had the lowest number and I subtracted one away and jumped to the top and keep counting down that way. Okay? Um, who do you have for computer hardware? Paddy, is it? So you've done two's complement? Yeah. Did he show you that kind of the, the, the circular number where you've got like zero at the top, and then it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, minus seven, minus six, minus. That's essentially what happens with integers, is they are circular reference numbers. If you go above or below the lower or upper bound, it just goes to the maximum or minimum, like the opposite pole. And it keeps going around. It's as if you've got the whole number line and you curve it together, it's just the next number you get across. Okay, this is uh, something called overflow, okay? So if you ever see the word overflow, or sometimes it's called underflow, but generally overflow is the way it's referred to, it means when we exceed the maximum number range of value, and the result is we drop to the opposite side. So if we're, if we're at the max and we go plus plus, we drop to the minimum. If we're at the minimum, we go minus minus, we jump to the max. Okay, that's question one. That is 40 marks. That should take you approximately an hour of your exam, based on off, off of my one and a half minute time. Okay, so eight questions. And uh, this one here, we, or sorry, this one here we have eight. In the papers you're going to get, one of the papers is six questions, one of the papers is seven questions. I don't know what paper you're getting, so it's six to seven questions. Yes, the guys are the best. If we, if we attempted them all, we had time. So, here's the thing. Question one is compulsory. You have to get the grade for that. So, all elements in question one are compulsory. Okay? It's the remaining two, three, four, five, six that I give you your best combination of. So, in the class test, there was no compulsory elements. Do your best, or answer all of them, I'll give you your best two questions. In this here, it will be answer, if you answer all the questions, I'll give you question one plus your best four other questions. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, question one, if you have a really, really good question one, you can pass or get very close to passing the exam paper just off of that. And there's nothing really in there that isn't on the left-hand side of our slide of our content. And that's what I mean, is that if you're, if, if, if this is, if this is a wobbly module for you and you're just not 100% on it, or you're having a bad day in the exam, which can happen, a good question one 
can put you in a can put you over the line, put you so close to over the line that whatever you do in the subsequent questions can bring you up to that passing grade. Okay. Obviously, I'm hoping all of you will be much more confident, much more uh, able in the exam. But exams are weird. Okay. Now, section two. Section two in this example here is going to have oh, four questions. Um, and you're meant to do three. The new version of the paper will have five questions. You're to do four of them. The big difference here, whenever you see, if you're going back and having a look at past papers, if you see the word design, you can ignore it. I'm not asking you to design anything. If you see, if like in the, was, was it you guys with the class test that one of the questions had, please show your design. And I think you can ignore that. Um, if, I don't think it has, because I haven't got any feedback from the examiner, so I'm assuming everything's fine. But if it happens that that's on the exam page, I will go around to every single one you go, and you can cross that out, you can ignore it, there are no marks going for it. Okay? So let's have a look at the questions here. So, this is a 15 mark question in the exam you'll take on the 16th. Uh, write a function that takes a number n from the user as an input, uh, and then prints out all of the prime numbers up to that number n. A prime number is a number that is divisible by 1 and the number itself. For example, if we enter in 34, all of the prime numbers of 34 go from 1 up to 31. So it's the numbers that we see there are prime. Every other number on that number line, so the number 4, the number 6, the number 9, the number 8, the number 10, the number 12, they are not prime numbers. Okay. Couple of things. First of all, I'm asking you to write a function or a method. You do not need public static void main. You do not need your imports. Okay? You can write them. You won't lose any marks. You're just losing out in time. You're going to take user input. So you're going to need to have a scanner inside your method to take in user input. And it prints out the values. You're not returning anything back. Usually, if I ask you to do a method, you will either see the word return or you'll see the word print. And that should give you an indication of what the return type should be. If I say print, the return type can be void. If I say return boolean, I'm expecting a boolean. If you print out, that's not what I asked for. Uh, so that's the first step. Second step is actually calculating the prime numbers. If I was to take a single number, did I ask this in the class test? I can't remember. If I was to take a single number, just one number, and check it as prime, the way we would do it is we would divide every number in between these two numbers here to see do any of them divide it evenly. So let's say I take the number 30, which is a prime number, because I can see it here. I'm not going to divide it by 1, because every single number in, in, in existence divides by 1. You divide any number by 1, you get that number again. Divide 13 by 1, you get 13. I'm not going to divide it by 13. Divide 13 by 13, you get 1. Okay? Every number is divisible by 1. Every number is divisible by 13. But only prime numbers are restricted to those two values. Non-prime numbers has some other number in between. So if we took the number 13, I would do the check. Does 2 divide into 13 evenly? No. Okay, increment that. Does 3 divide into 13 evenly? No. Increment. Does 4 divide in? No. Increment. Does 5 divide in? No. 6? No. 7? No. 8? No. 9? No. 10? No. 11? No. 12? No. Right. I have checked all possible values in between these two here. That number is prime. Let's go on to the next one. 14. Does 2 divide into 14 evenly? Yes. Okay, that number's not prime. That's, that's as simple as the check is. Now, that's a really inefficient way of checking for it, but that's the way I would expect if this question came up, that's what I would be looking for. A simple solution. You're in an exam pressure. If you have 15 marks going for that, that's 22 minutes. You do not have time to formulate a really efficient, beautiful block of code. I want it done as opposed to the best possible version because this is first year. Okay? So that's how you do it for one number. You have a loop to go from two up to one less than the number and check every division in between. If I wanted to do all of the numbers, Check if all the numbers from 1 up to 34 are prime. I need another loop around that first loop to say, okay, check if 1 is prime. Okay, check if 2 is prime. Okay, check if 3 is prime. And the check is that dividing all the numbers from 2 up to 1 less. Okay? 
In this example, what I'm looking for is the signature of the method. Is that correct? I don't care what you call the method. I'm looking for the return type and the input, if, if they're correct. I'm looking to see, have you checked if one number is prime? And then the final thing is, have you checked for all of the numbers in between this and this, the two ranges that we have? Okay, so there's three sections. I said, roughly that would equate to five marks for a correct signature of the method. Um, probably five marks or six marks going for checking if one number is prime, and then four to five marks going for checking if all of the numbers in that list are prime or not prime, and then printing that. That's a very rough guide, but that's kind of how that's broken down. Okay, question three. Write a function that prints out the reversed version of a string. Okay, uh, so some examples here. Uh, if I send in a string with spaces, it'll print it out with spaces. If I send in a string with no spaces, it'll print it out with no spaces. Uh, I think the typo I have there is that there's no, I, I haven't replicated the capital letters. Uh, a method to do this is if you use two character array, it'll return back an array of characters, which will make it a little bit easier to do. Uh, and then I have here, there are many ways of doing this task. Can anyone think of a different way of doing it? Okay, so we haven't covered it specifically in, in the class, and that's why I was fine not to um, not 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 to mention it here. I mention it as in there's many ways to accomplish it. So you're not forced into using a character array. Another way of doing it is just have we've done so much string processing where we start at zero and we work our way through and we get car at zero, car at one, car at two. What if we started at the length of that string and worked our way back to zero? That's another way of doing it. Simplest way of doing it, string dot reverse. Okay, but that requires you to remember that in the exam. So there are multiple ways of doing this. If you gave me a method which took in a string, did string dot reverse and gave me a new string and returned that back, that's full marks. You've got all the things I'm looking for. But in the same respect, if you did a loop that counted from the back of the string to the front of the string, that would be fine. If you converted it to a character array and did the same thing, that would also be fine. Okay? And um, there is no one way of solving any of these questions. And if you have the presence of mind to remember something like string.reverse and use it correctly, you get the marks for it. It's not like an exam or it's not like an assignment. In an assignment, very often I say you cannot use string.reverse. And the reason for that is I want you to do it the long way around so you get comfortable with that loop processing of, of going first, second, third, show up the characters. In an exam, I've already assessed that. So if you remember the command, go for it. Because then it shows you're going in your head. You haven't spent hours on the internet searching for a shortcut. Okay. Question four. Okay, so here's an, uh, an array question. Create a method that has passed an array of integers as a parameter. Your method should perform the following operations. It should output the uh, first index where seven is uh, exists. You should, uh, or an appropriate method if it's not found, you should output the values of the array in reverse order. You should check if all the values in the array are unique. And then we can see, except, oh, come back. You can see examples of the output here. So again, let's go back. This is a method you've been asked. So I have a method which is going to take in a string. No, it's going to take in an array of integers as my input. So that has to be inside the brackets. It does not need to return anything. I use the word output, so it's printing out the screen. So I don't need to have a return type, so it's going to be public static void, array test, and then we're going to open our brackets and go int array a, whatever it is. How would I check for the first one? To find the first index for the input where, where the value is equal to seven. Bearing in mind, I don't know what the array looks like, except for it's an integer array. Anyone want to make a guess? Just the end statement? If no. statement, okay. But how would I, uh, I mean, so. Uh, you, you, you do the for loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, okay. 
again, going back to what I said when we were talking about strings, when you have a collection of stuff, your first quarter call should be, I'm going to loop, start at one end, it goes to the other end, and I'm going to do a certain check or a certain thing on every element. That's exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to have a loop that starts on this side. It's going to go all the way to this end here. For every element, I'm going to go, hey, are you equal to seven? If it is, tell me where that is. If it isn't, move on to the next letter. That's exactly what our next integer. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Okay. Second part, how would I output the values in a reverse order? <sighs> kind of talked about it in the previous question of the string. Array that lends and then string that reverse? Or array string, that reverse. string, no, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so with, with arrays, it's not that simple. You don't okay. have that advantage with arrays. So that, that's, remember we talked about strings, all this extra stuff like car off and index all and reverse and substring arrays don't have that so let's look at one of the other ways of doing it so the other way of doing it was you create a loop that starts at the back of the array and counts to the front and just print out the value each time it is as simple as that Every, <coughs> each of these are just slight variations on each other and the reason why i've asked all three of them is to see do you understand the difference do you understand an array can go from front to back Second one, can array can go from back to front. And then the third one, where was it? How would I check to see if all the values in this array are unique? You have to have store each index mm -hmm. in another variable. Yeah. And store that variable. Which, I don't know. No, you're on, you're on the right track. You're on the track. So, first of all, based off of the two answers previously, it shouldn't be a surprise. I'm going to need a loop. I have to check every element to see if it's different to every other element. Okay? <clears throat> the systematic approach of start at one end and go to the other end, we're going to keep that as well. So, I'm going to create a loop. I'm going to take the current value, page. I'm going to create another loop. This is very much like our sorting algorithm. And I'm going to go from my current position plus one all the way to the end of the array. And see, so do any of these numbers here match this number here? And if they don't, fine. Well, then I'm going to move on to here. And I'll do the same thing. Check from here, go forward. None of them match that. Okay, move to this one here. Check from here, move forward. And when I do find a match, so you can see here that we've got eight and eight, we've got 10, we've got 10. Uh, when I do find a match, I'm going to stop and I'm going to go, it's not like once you find one duplicate, you can you don't need to check it and else you can say, well, oh, the values aren't unique. But that's you have you absolutely have the right approach. Keep a temporary copy of <clears throat> whatever the value is where you are and check on the right hand side. If you think back to how we looked at the sorting algorithms, you had the sorted side, the part that you knew was already in the right order, and you've been to be processed, and you have the right hand side, the unsorted side. And effectively that's what we're doing. We would have the check, if we were here, we would have, we know that we've checked for eight and we've checked for minus five, but we don't know whether we've checked all these values here, so I have to work my way across. And as soon as I move the counter from here to here, I now know that everything on the left-hand side there has been checked, and everything on the right-hand side has not been checked, and I work my way through that solution. And again, roughly five marks for each of those three facts. Okay, and then the last question of this paper. Design a Java program to read a text file called words.txt and to locate the longest word in that file. Now, a bit of background to this. Last year, rather than the question I gave you, the last time I gave you, I gave the group a, um, a spell checker program, essentially. It wouldn't fix spelling errors, but it would identify spelling errors. So I gave them a text file that had 350,000 unique English words. And what I did is I said, right, your job is to load that into your program, however you want to do that, and check through a inputted string from the user or check through a different text file and highlight the words that are misspelled. So the way we identify if a word is misspelled is if it's not already in the, uh, excuse me, if it's not already in the, in the word file. If I can't find it in the word file, it doesn't exist. So in that scenario, 
the students knew the structure of that Word file. For you, it is a file with 350,000 lines with one word per line. Okay, so with that information, how would you find the longest word in that file? You've done a variation on this for your first assignment. You found the longest word in a sentence, or the longest word in a group of text. So the variation on that. The only difference is reading the text file rather than reading just a string. Collection of data. So in the collection of data, what's our go-to way of, of going through all of that data? The last four questions. All of the big questions have relied on this structure, a loop. We have a collection of 350,000 words. We need to have a systematic way of doing it. So we take the first word, so we have a loop that goes from the first word to the last word. How do I know if a string is bigger than another string? How about that? Well, string not length. But yes, absolutely, string not length. String not length gives you a numerical value. So I can hold that value, and then I can check it against the curve. So what I would do, if this was me, is I would open up my text file, I'd read it into a string array, or I, or, or actually, sorry, I wouldn't even need to do that because I don't need to maintain it. I would create a max variable, and I'd set the value max variable to zero. The maximum word I've come across so far is zero. And I would read through that text file until there's nothing left in that text file, and every word I read in, I'd copy it into a string, and I'd go, what's the length of that string? Is that bigger than my max? Okay. If it's bigger than my max, then that's the new maximum, and I keep a copy of whatever the word was, elephant, or whatever it might be. And I move on to the next word, and I move on to the next word. And I keep doing that until I hit the end of the text file. And at the end of the text file, I have checked all 350,000 words. I know I've been systematic about it, so I've gone from the first to the last word. I know that my check works well in isolation. If I just have two words, I can tell you which one of them is the bigger one. So scaling that up to over a quarter of a million, it's just it takes longer to run, but it's the same process working that way through it. Okay? So in that scenario there, um, obviously that question was, was dependent on knowing what the structure of the word file. Uh, for ye, I know that's why you give you a bit of background, but it's a pretty simple, like if I took out, <clears throat> if I took out the, uh, the, the, the word TXT and I said, you have an array of strings, tell me the largest string in that array, that's something you'd probably be able to do, because you know, oh, it's an array, I use a loop to go through it, oh, it's comparing two strings, I, I use the dot length. That's just working your way through that. Okay, that's the last question there. Um, so that's the August paper from last year. Having gone through the questions and having me, had me talk about the questions, are there any queries that you guys have at the moment? No, okay. A um, couple things. Next week we are back here in this room at the same time for uh, an, an edition of BAS. Um, unless I get an email from one of you saying, hey, can you look at this topic? I'm just going to take the May paper from last year do the exact same thing, work my way through that. And again, if questions and answers come up throughout that class, we can pause and we can have, we can have a look at that stuff. Uh, so that's what's going to happen next week. Um, the number one way I would advise you to study for this test is do it under exam conditions. Get prior tests. You have seven other ones to have a look at. Start with this one because you kind of you, you you've got the extra hint of I've kind of talked through each of the solutions. So start with this one and work your way backwards. But have a look at all the questions. Ideally, do them under exam conditions. So you don't need to do a three-hour block. But if you're studying strings this week, or if you're studying arrays, identify a couple of array questions for past exams. Sit down and go right. Half an hour block. It'll take 22 minutes or 25 minutes or whatever it is. Sit down and set a timer, put my notes away, blank page, work through this. Okay? If you have to look at your notes, you have to look at your notes. But the more you practice it, the less you'll have to look at your notes. So when you get to the, the real one on the 16th, you'll be comfortable in that environment. All right? That's, the, that's what I'd advise for prep for this. Just do the papers. 
if you, and again, I, I can be naive and ignore the fact that you have other modules to study for, um, or selfish, whichever you look at it. But in a perfect scenario, you would have done all eight papers completely, done every one of them under their exam conditions. 24 hour commitment, so that's, that's a lot. So pick the bits you can do, pick the bits you can't do, pick the bits, like, number one thing, if you're doing, if, you, if you're dedicating time to study, let's say over the weekend, get all eight exam papers worth of those question one part A's, do all of them. Check them all, make sure you understand if you got them wrong, why you got them wrong. Do all of them. And then maybe pick the topics you're most confident with first and find the big questions in them and do them. Be strategic about your study. Get the stuff that you're comfortable with done first, because that will build your confidence and make you more motivated just to, to tackle the stuff you're less comfortable with. Um, <clears throat> so, these always come with questions. I do not post the solutions to exam papers. The reason why I don't post solutions exam papers is essentially uh, I used to, and what would happen is I would get back uh, whatever solution I had. So let's say from 2018, I put up the papers. Uh, I asked a question that's kind of the same but different, and I get some student who's just learnt off the solution, no thought, just learnt it off, and then bleh, out the page, and it's kind of the solution. But it's not. It doesn't show any understanding of the question apart from that they saw the word array or they saw the word text file or they saw the word binary or whatever it might be. Um, and I've had arguments with the external examiner where I've said, well, look, they haven't demonstrated they understand that. And then they've said, well, they have because they have these parts here. So they're answering a different question. So to combat that, I don't publish the solutions. However, if you attempt any question and you're unsure about it, send me an email with, with, with your solution and I will give you feedback on it. Okay? Um, Ideally, because you should be handwriting this stuff, just <clears throat> everybody has a camera phone, take a photo of it, make sure it's in focus, take a photo of it, email me the photo, I can go through it and I can give pretty quick feedback on that's right, that's wrong, I would have given you X out of 15 in this question here. It gives you an idea of how you're getting on and how you're approaching it. Um, I'm happy to give feedback to any student who shows me they've put in a bit of work. If I get, and I get it every year, a student like, hey, what's the solution to question four, 2016 August? Unless I see your effort first, I'm not willing to help you along with that because, again, it's one, it's forcing you to do a bit of study, which is, your, is for your benefit. But two, it's making you make an attempt at it. It's making you uh, think about the question and try to solve it before you see where I was expecting it. And most of the time, whatever amount of work you put in, even if you kind of go, oh, I have to do a solution, you go off and spend half an hour and you quickly send me an email. Maybe you don't need to spend half an hour. You spend 15 minutes quickly writing down stuff. Like a real slapdash approach to it. Um, and you send it to me. Those 15 minutes actually will count toward your preparation. They will count, they will benefit you. And you might be 100% correct in the solution you give, but I'd be able to point you in the right direction. I'd be able to kind of work from that. So um, between now and the 16th, well, between now and the 15th, I usually put a moratorium of the day before, and I'm not going to be answering 30 or 40 emails from every student, but I want about this one, I want about this one, I want about this one, because I know how the exam panic sets in. So up until, let's say, the, the <clears throat> close of business on the 14th, you send me an email, you're going to get a response back going, this is good, this is bad, this is where you can improve. Um, so fire away with your emails. For next week, if it's a specific topic or in your research of exam questions, you want me to look at one specifically here at the board, fire me in on that before next week's class, and we can approach that. If you feel supremely comfortable with this subject, you don't need to come next week. I would take the attitude of you're paying for the course, get the best value for money you can by using every contact minute you can with me. But that's your choice. You're all out. Fair enough. Anyone have any questions for me? Just make one to think there, it's next Tuesday at six o'clock. Yeah. Exact same timetable as next week, yep. Yeah. Um, I do not know if any of your other lecturers have requested um, classes. Has the, is Paddy doing a revision class? You've Paddy after me, don't you? Yeah, yeah is Paddy doing a revision class? I'm not sure, I don't feel the same. Okay. Um, since you're the only ones that are here, 
is making an in for six o'clock a massive hassle or is it achievable for all of you? Because I can, if, if Paddy's not doing the class, I can push it from quarter past six to quarter past eight. Just give you that extra 15 minutes if that would help. Okay, well look. First 15 minutes between me setting up the YouTube and getting it ready, all I'm probably gonna get covered is that question one part one. Okay, so we're not you're not gonna miss a math event and it'll be on the video. We'll start at six. But yeah, it'll be same class, same time, last contact point of the year. Any other questions? What's the deadline for the third assignment? Next year's over. I can't remember. What did I say? Did anyone remember what I said? It was a before next class. Before the next, before next or class. The last class as in the revision class. Oh, okay, yeah. So before the class. So if you can get it to me for five to six, that's fine. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, the, the before the class it, it, it is 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 what I'll go with. Um, obviously, I won't be correcting them to that class, but you'll have them before you sit here tonight. And what about the class test? Uh, the class test. Can I publish results from that? Right. Okay, I'll publish the results. I have everything's corrected. I need to do that. And my aim on Thursday is to correct the workbooks and put the workbook two and publish all that out as well. Has everybody submitted workbook two? You should have at this point. Not yet. Well, it's probably more questions. Correct. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so you know, so so by the end of this week, then you'll have all of your grades bar the third assignment which you haven't submitted yet. Okay, folks. If there are no questions, um, we'll finish up there. I'll start to stop the. YouTube thing, uh, stream, yes, and. Uh